Hello everyone, I'm Dave Householder, blessed to be your Bible teacher, and today's Sunday sermon is from the first chapter of the Gospel of John, verse 14. Just one verse, but uh, this one verse has a lot in it. So we're going to unpack it, and it's going to perhaps bring you a little bit of joy in what can be a very stressful time, where it's really, really dark outside. I, I don't know about you, but with the time change and the, the shorter days, it, I almost feel like putting on my pajamas after lunch. It's, it just seems so dark. Every year seems like it gets darker. I know that's not true, but it certainly feels like it. And our, our little internal bulb, our, our joy bulb, can get a little bit dim. And so we're going to be sharing from John 1, 14. And this message will brighten your day with the good news of Jesus Christ. It's going to brighten your emotions, your temperament, your vibe, everything else. If you pay attention and you get this promise from the Word of God. So John 1 verse 14. I want to tell you about a disappointing post office visit I just took. Just this last week I went down to the post office to get some Christmas stamps and the lady, a very nice lady, I'm not anti post office, I'm not bagging on the post office, none of that kind of stuff, but uh, she says, oh you want the elves don't you? And she showed me the elf stamps. Uh, no, don't you have something a little bit more Christmassy, nothing against elves, but you know, <laughs> something else, something with Christmas or Jesus or something. And I kid you not, it was like seven different, seven different stamps later before I finally got to Mary and Jesus. There's winter animals, snow globes, poinsettias, holiday elves, snowy butterfly, uh, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and then after all seven, number eight, and you can look on the post office website too and type in Christmas stamps and number eight will be the first stamp that says Christmas and there you have Mary and the baby and those are the ones I got. I got a whole bunch of those stamps but I was disappointed. I, I feel like Jesus is being squeezed out of Christmas. It's almost like the word Christmas is almost like a dirty word out there like you have to say holiday or season or something like that because otherwise somehow you're you're being mean to people which just is odd to me to have this big celebration of the greatest man in history's birthday and we have a tendency in our culture to, to leave that out or to marginalize it somehow. Uh, truth is Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without Jesus. That's what we're celebrating, the birth of Jesus. So yeah, I had a little bit of a dim bulb there and uh, wasn't feeling great walking home and thinking, oh my goodness, you know, is, is Christmas just become something else? My wife and I were coming back from the Concordia University Christmas concert last night and drove by South Coast Plaza and oh my goodness, the thing is, was just, it was late and it was packed. There was prompt to wait for a parking space. I thought if only, if only our churches were packed during the Christmas season. But people are too busy to go to church, too busy to, uh, to celebrate the birth of Jesus because they've got this gigantic dinner and they've got to buy all these gifts. And they've got to do all of these things. But where's the birth of Jesus in all this? So my, my bulb, my emotional bulb, was a little on the dim side, and I needed to work on it. So today's passage is John 1, verse 14. And you get your Bible, and you can pause this, actually, and read along with me if you'd like. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, I was always taught when I learned the Bible that there is the what and the so what of every Bible passage. The what is what were the people trying to say and what's the truth about this passage. And the so what is how do we apply it to our lives? How do we make this work in our lives? And the what is extremely important. You got to get the what right before you get the the so what right. But the so what is the most important thing. So we're going to start with the what though. What is this verse about? The word became flesh. Well, this is a theological thing. It's called the incarnation. The Latin term carn, we get carnivore, flesh, uh, carniasata for that matter, incarnation. The word became flesh. There was, a, there was a union of the physical and the spiritual. The Holy Spirit came together with the Virgin Mary and uh, produced Jesus. And we think of the word in the very beginning being Jesus. That's what John talks about in the Gospel of John chapter 1. 
And the whole word, the whole Bible became flesh in Jesus. Jesus is the living word. And he embodied that union, that connection between the spiritual and the physical. We say Emmanuel, which is a Semitic term, Imanu, which means together with us, and El, which is God, Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us, God becoming flesh. Now, this is a really, really key concept here. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German pastor who during World War II was executed for being resistant to Hitler. And he said, if Jesus Christ is not true God, in other words, if he's not a God becoming man, then how can he help us? And if he's not true man, how could he help us? Uh, I remember 1968, and I remember there were a whole bunch of assassinations, and in rather rapid fire order, there was Robert F. Kennedy, and then there was Martin Luther King Jr. And both of those assassinations happened kind of close together, and I was a little kid, and I was not a little kid, but I was a kid, and I was traumatized by that. And I, I still remember my dad saying, we could be heading into civil war, and I was terrified by the whole thing. But if Jesus was just a man, and he wasn't God, it would be like Kennedy or, or Martin Luther King getting shot. It's a, it's a good person getting killed. What good is there in that? How can that save us from our sins? Unless God came down and gave himself up for us, how could that death have any benefit for us? And if God wasn't truly a man, how could he know the troubles that we face? How could he feel what we need? How could he know what it is to be human? So how can you save something without knowing what it's like to be limited as we are? Uh, a lot of us this time of the year are concerned with our bank balances, our, our church bank balances for that matter, or your business bank balances. Is the black ink going to outweigh the red ink? Am I going to be able to have enough money to survive and thrive if I retire from work? Is uh, If I should get hurt or something, if I'm in my 30s or 40s, how am I going to be able to make sure that I can maintain my financial stability? Do I have enough, mar enough money to get married? Do I have enough money to buy a house? All of those things. And those are human worries. And if, if Jesus didn't have to deal with that, and he did as a, as a builder, the Bible says a tecton, a builder, and he had a business, and he had to make sure that the business balanced, and and also the the physicality of being human. If he didn't become man, our bodies are not perfect, and all kinds of things happen to us. So we get these diagnoses from the doctor. We've got at least two or three people here from Spirit Station, from the Well, from from uh, Surf City Church, who are dealing with chemo right now. It's it's a, a horrific thing to get a a cancer diagnosis like that and as we get older some of those diagnoses tend to kind of pile up on us if jesus wasn't truly human then how would he know what it's like to be us how would he know how to solve our problem if he didn't feel what it's like to feel our problems what about social issues relational issues uh, Jesus once said to his disciples after saying something challenging a little bit later on in the book of John everyone was leaving him he said you gonna leave me too you guys taken off on me because he knew what it was like to have people ghost him literally to to leave and to walk away and never come back and you've probably had some people the last few years ghost you people who are friends and all of a sudden they just disappear they don't they're not in contact anymore or they stop coming to to be with you and they don't call anymore you have to call them and that's tough a lot of you at Christmas are gonna have some really challenging times because uh, your families are complicated and who, how are you going to gather the family for a dinner, for a gathering, for going to church together when you're not all on the same page? How is that going to work out? A lot of us have challenging relationships with our children, our grandchildren, and our parents, our brothers and our sisters, our co-workers. Jesus knew what it was like to have challenging relationships because a lot of people turned on him too. He started out real popular, ended up the least popular man in all of Israel by the time he was crucified. People crowds were turning on him, the same crowds that welcomed him into the city. So these kinds of things, we unless he knew what it felt to feel those things, how could he know our situation? How would he know how to love us and to save us? And so he had to be true God, otherwise his death would mean nothing, and he had to be true man, otherwise his death wouldn't connect to who it is that we were, and his death wouldn't have been real. He would have just been some God pretending to be dead like some science fiction thing. 
But I've always said that uh, Jesus was more like Batman than like Superman. If you would have shot him, he would have died. I've always kind of wondered about Batman. Why do they always have these elaborate ways to kill him and nobody just goes up and shoots him? <laughs> None of the bad guys could do that. But anyways, I, I digress. Jesus Christ had to be true God and true man. Now that's the what. We have the spiritual becoming physical. That's the incarnation. There's the what. But here comes the so what. And the so what deals with our issues with that dim bulb that I'm talking about, that uh, the troubledness that we have in life with those very real troubles. I'm not here to tell you those troubles aren't real. Those financial troubles, those relational troubles, those diagnoses, those sense of purposelessness of being lost in life, not really knowing which way to go, how to fill our times, how to be useful, all of those things. So here's the so what. Let's move on to the so what from the, from the what. So now we're not God. We're not becoming God, so we're not Jesus. But the incarnation points to the fact that we, like Jesus, are both spiritual and physical beings. We have a spiritual side to us not just a physical side to us. We're not just a, a wet robot, a wet computer that's very complicated and somehow uh, able to reflect on things. We are much, much more than that. We have a spiritual reality. You and I have a sense of existence, of consciousness. There's something it's like to be <laughs> in our skin. And it's something which is very private because you can tell people stories about what you're thinking, but you can't show them your thoughts, your dreams, or your emotions, or your feelings. So I just would, uh, I would really like to um, show you that the incarnation, the truth of God becoming a human being, also points to the truth of you and I, just like Jesus, being spiritual and physical. Now, we're not God, we're not Jesus, who nobody wants to be, for goodness sake. I'm just saying that we share that truth with him. You and I, the Bible tells us, are made in the very image of God. When we look upon God at some point, when we're with him in glory, we're going to recognize the family resemblance. That's a beautiful, beautiful thought. And the truth is, everyone is made in the image of God. All human beings are. And when we recognize that in other people, and even people that are our enemies, then we recognize that sort of spark of, of holiness within all of them, the fingerprint of God, so to speak, and we're going to treat people differently, even people we disagree with. That doesn't mean we have to agree with them. It doesn't mean we have to go along with them. But it does mean, it does mean that we have to respect them. I'm saving martial arts for my 70s, and uh, I really am. And I'd love to do it sometime. I just don't have time right now. And I love it how in martial arts people bow to each other before their battle, before their contest, respecting your opponent. And I think there's something to that. Good sportsmanship we were taught in Little League Baseball, where you shake hands afterwards. You don't mouth off to the to the umpire and all that kind of stuff. There's something about being a good loser, about being a good winner, and being a gracious winner. And those kinds of things, I think, come from the idea that everyone is made in the image of God. And we're going to treat people differently if we believe that. Your, your DNA programming is just absolutely fantastic in every cell of your body you have this amazing code that could recreate your entire body. Not just one place in your body, every single cell of your body has this incredible, incredible information storage thing. If we had computers that could do that, holy smokes, we'd solve all of the earthly problems with that. But God put that incredible code inside of all of us. Also, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove at his baptism. Well. You and I can also be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can, de can descend on us in exactly the same way. We can receive the Holy Spirit just like Jesus did. Romans 8 talks about how we have a choice between living according to the Spirit, according to the flesh. Because just like Jesus, we've got spirit and flesh. We, the incarnation of Jesus becoming a baby at Bethlehem, God becoming a baby, it, it points, it illumines part of our nature, that we are also spiritual and physical. Now, when you receive Jesus, you say yes to that spiritual side of yourself. You say yes, that you're not just a machine. You're just not a complicated computer. You have a soul. You have a spirit. You have a will. You've got a heart. You are able to create. You're, 
you are much like God. You love giving. You enjoy giving. And those kinds of things are what sets us apart from all of the rest of matter. I talked about winning the lottery. And what I mean by that is there's gazillions and gatrillions or whatever of, of mass in the universe, of uh, kilograms of mass. And you and I got to be the self-conscious, creative part of that for a number of decades in this creation. And that is winning the lottery. It really is. It's much, more, it's much harder to win that lottery than any other lottery. And you've won it. So the question is, what are you going to do with your winning ticket? What are you going to do with this incredible gift of conscious life for several decades here on Earth? So that's getting into some of the so what. So let's look at Romans 8, 9 through 10. I talked about Romans 8 earlier. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Now, this is what I'm talking about here. The Spirit of God can live in us too, just like he lived in Jesus. The incarnation of Jesus awakens us to our true source of light. So if your bulb is growing dim, we've got a, a much brighter bulb that we can uh, have access to. Now, my wife has a 2001 Yukon, and we've had trouble with the running light. And it's really easy to change the light. You just go in there and uh, put a new bulb in, but it kept exploding. Now that tells me that's not a problem with the bulb, it's a problem with the power source. And so what I did is I got a new socket, new wiring, and redid it, put the bulb in, and it's working great. Now, same thing with us. We don't generate our own light. We get our light from the Lord. We reflect his light. And if we can be wired into the Holy Spirit and his presence in our lives, then we too can have brighter lights in our lives. We can have more joy, more fulfillment, less stress. I had someone come up to me after church and saying, the teaching we're doing right here in the book of John is, is helping him to live without worry, trusting that God is around and living in his light. Sure, he's got problems like everyone else, but understanding where our power comes from and that we don't have to generate it ourselves, don't have to work it up ourselves. I got one of these little one of these little uh, flashlights that you crank in an emergency. And it's not like we have to keep cranking to keep the light going. We just have to plug into the power source of the Lord and be filled and refilled with his Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit brightens up our dim light bulbs. So we are having a day like I did coming back from the post office thinking, oh my goodness, uh, Jesus is being left out of, of Christmas and everyone's going to the mall and no one's going to church. When I'm starting to feel like that, then I can just tap into the Holy Spirit because in him is fullness of joy. Here's some practicalities because this spiritual stuff can sound awfully theological and challenging to people. First of all, let's be honest with each other. Sometimes our bulbs are a little on the dim side. Sometimes we're, we're just dragging around and we're, we're, we're filled with stress and anxiety and, and we're not particularly joyful. I know it happens to me from time to time and my wife picks a picks up on it and uh, lets me know about it. And so for honest to one another, being joyful is not pretending like you don't have problems. Being joyful is not pretending like you don't need the Lord. Being joyful is not having a dim bulb saying it's a bright bulb. If it's if you're going through a dim bulb time, be honest about it with others and with the Lord. Second thing, we cannot turn up the brightness of our own lights. We have to get that power from the outside. We can behold and reflect his glory. Going back to John 1, 14, which we started out with today, we behold and reflect his glory. Verse 14, we have seen his glory. This is the second half of verse 14. First part is the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we reflect His glory. So get up close to, get up close to God, and the closer you get to God, the more light you're going to reflect. Mercury and Venus reflect a lot more light than Neptune and Pluto. 
the closer you are to the Lord, the more of his light you're going to receive and reflect. Come on Wednesday nights, Wednesday with friends, we're going through these very topics here, how to make these things practical, how to put the light of Christ to work in our lives. So show up on Wednesdays at 6.30 and bring something to share for food and uh, get involved in these interactive discussions about how to make this stuff happen, because you can believe it's true, but really not know what to do with it. So that's why we have Wednesday nights. Hope to see you there. Last thing here is get out of your head and be receptive to the Spirit. Overthinking and openness to the Spirit are two different things. Overthinking, at least in my life, I, I have trouble sleeping when I'm overthinking. Um, I have trouble relaxing. I tend to get tense. I tend to get negative. And if I just stop it, <laughs> that sort of overthinking, and open myself up to the power of the Holy Spirit and the light of Christ, things happen differently. I start to see things differently. I let go of those things with which I have no real control. So it's a matter of getting out of our ego, out of the flesh, and operating in the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness, self-control, goodness, all that stuff in Galatians 5, 22, the fruit of the Spirit is not the fruit of the effort. It's not a matter of trying harder to be uh, gentle, self-controlled, all those things. Because when we're filled with the Spirit, we will have the fruit of the Spirit, and we will treat people differently. And there's the fruit of the Spirit, which is all those good character qualities, which the Lord gives us. It's not something we have to make ourselves do. And there's also the gifts of the Spirit. Now, I've looked at all the spiritual gifts list, and there's no such thing as a spiritual gift of crabbiness. So, so, so don't be crabby. Uh, Christian crabbiness is a, is a contradiction in terms. If you start to feel crabby, just get away from people and ask the Holy Spirit to come into your life and to bring his light with him. We move from hoarding, trying to maintain what we have, to generating. And uh, people who generate, who create jobs, who create opportunities, who are generous, who give, generous, generate, uh, generate, it's all together. People who make things happen. And we, we try to give more to the world than we receive. We want to make the world a better place. So that's, that's really key here to rather what can I get, what can I give? We move from being a consumer of Christianity to an ambassador for Christ. Uh, a lot of people here in Southern California, there's a there's sort of a feel like it's a big consumer culture. Believe me, it is. I've lived in other places. And that works its way to the church thing, too. We say, well, I'm not being fed because they're not performing like I want them to perform. The pastor doesn't talk the way I want him to talk. The worship team doesn't play the songs I would pick. And uh, they're not doing the kind of things I think they should be doing. So I'm going to look for a church where they do. And we become consumers of Christian entertainment rather than missionaries, ambassadors for the Lord. Rather than getting out there and doing things to make stuff happen. And so this is really a shift that happens when the Holy Spirit is part of our lives. We move from consumers to ambassadors for the Lord, making the world a better place. And also, uh, rather than escaping our problems, we, we look at healing them. And rather than uh, looking at people and just avoiding them, we, we go to help them to bring healing. Praying for people for healing is one of those amazing things that we can do for people, to lay hands on people, pray for healing, and bring healing to them and to the world itself. Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. The God of hope fill you with joy. We don't generate joy. We get filled with joy from the outside. Any more than a pitcher can generate water, we receive from the outside. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. When my bulb is dim, I'm not abounding in hope, and I need more of the Lord in my life. Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And with that, I would say, come Holy Spirit. I would invite you uh, not to pray with me because this is a recording. and I'm not actually here praying with you at this point. But to, to go off by yourself, to open up your hands and be receptive. And just say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, bring light into my life. Bring your living water into my life. Bring your joy into my life. Fill me up with your joy. Give me what I need. 
give me the guidance I need. You, you Holy Spirit, uh, the Bible says that you will teach me all things. It really says that. It's a promise. Teach me the things I need to know. Show me the way I need to go. And, and pray that openly. And feel the joy start to well up inside of you. That's the good news for today. You and I both have dim bulbs from time to time and we are lacking in hope and we get angry and frustrated and tired of life. We become crabby and all that. And what we need is not to use willpower to break our way out of that, but to just use the power of the Holy Spirit to fill us up, to change us, to treat other people differently. That's the light of Christ. That's the light of Christmas. A blessed Advent and Christmas to all of you. Please share this video with others who need hope and need encouragement. I think it's important that we spread. That's part of being an ambassador. You spread what we're doing out for other people to send healing out into the world. Have a great week, and we'll see you again at Spirit Station next Sunday.